afternoon, everyone. Thank you for making it here through the bad weather. I thought I couldn't uh, make it here on time, and that's one of the reasons why you had to wait a few minutes. Getting out of Northern Virginia into the District of Columbia was a bit of a slog, but uh, various detours later, I'm glad I made it. Um, I'm Shujah Nawaz. Um, I used to be the the, uh, the director of the South Asia Center at the Atlantic Council, so this was what I did uh, on a regular basis. So I've been asked today to welcome you on behalf of uh, the president of the Atlantic Council, Fred Kemp, and also of the new director of the South Asia Center, Irfan Nuruddin. Unfortunately, Irfan uh, is away uh, this week, so he couldn't be here to welcome you, and uh, uh, it would have been a pleasure to have seen him uh, at this event in particular, but uh, I'm sure you will have many opportunities of seeing him uh, and his team. Um, I'm delighted um, to introduce uh, today's topic and also say just a few words about the, uh, the, the uh, experts that are joining me on the panel. Um, uh, the topic is gambling with violence, non-state actors and outsourcing of war in Kashmir. This is based on, on a, a brilliant new book uh, by Yelena Bilberman. Uh, B, uh, Yelena is an assistant professor of political science at Skidmore College. Uh, but most importantly, for those of us at the South Asia Center, because we take credit for a lot of things um, that uh, happen around the world as well as uh, in the United States, uh, we were delighted a, a few years ago when we launched uh, Pakistan the U.S.-Pakistan Fellowship Program, uh, that in the inaugural class, uh, she was one of the persons that uh, we selected. And so we are now delighted that you know, she has uh, taken on an important position uh, in, the, in academia as well as produced this very fine book, which uh, from the title, as you can see, she uh, has some questions about whether um, the use of non-state actors is a plus or a minus. And so we hope to hear from her on that. And then, of course, we have uh, Aparna Pandey, uh, who is the director of the Initiative on the Future of India and South Asia at the Hudson Institute, uh, the author of a, a, a couple of very important books on Indian and Pakistan foreign policy, um, and uh, a regular commentator on issues related to the region, particularly on Pakistan. Uh, and then Michael Kugelman. Um, Michael uh, is the deputy director of the Asia program at the Wilson Center. He has, uh, is a ubiquitous presence on, on the media circuit now because uh, any time any newspaper or news media, television or radio wants a, a view on anything that happens in that part of the world, you see Michael's name, and, and we're delighted to have him because he follows events very closely, and he's been uh, particularly uh, involved in, in, in South Asian affairs at, with India and Pakistan uh, over the years, as well as on some track two initiatives. So uh, we look forward uh, to those remarks. Uh, with that, uh, can I request the uh, panelists to, to join me? And if, uh, Elena, you could please uh, open um, the discussion with your with your opening comment. Uh, what we'll do is uh, each of the panelists uh, will speak uh, briefly, and then um, I'll ask them some questions. And then we'll all, all have a conversation together. Uh, this is on the record. Also, uh, when it comes to questions, please make sure that you have questions. Um, the topic is such that it will provoke commentary and speeches and. Uh, all kinds of diatribes. Uh, and that's not uh, enhancing the, uh, the uh, discussion nor showing us the way forward. So we would really request that you work with us in asking good questions and hopefully we will get uh, good answers for you. Thank you. So um, please join me on the stage and Elena, you can come straight to the podium. Thank you. Well, I want to begin by thanking Trevor and Nidhi for doing such a great job organizing this um, through all the steps in the process. And of course, I would like to thank Shuja, Michael, and Naparna for being here 
this is such a stellar panel, a dream come true for me. Um, especially as this book has benefited so much from my experience in Pakistan, which was made possible by the fellowship uh, from the Atlantic Council. So she just, and also through his scholarship as well, his work has been very influential um, on, my, on this book, as you will see him cited. Um, so this book began as a dissertation um, over eight years ago. And since then, of course, having conducted field work and really diving deep into the subject matter, um, I learned some big lessons. And it really started as a question I had about Pakistan. Pakistan was in the news a lot, um, being labeled a state sponsor of terrorism. And I wanted to understand more why, um, what's really happening with Pakistan. And I was looking, as I was looking more into the subject matter, I realized it's a really global phenomenon. It's difficult to find a country, a state, that doesn't outsource violence in some way. So, so one big takeaway point, I think, from this book is that this is a global phenomenon. States try to outsource. Sometimes they say no, sometimes they say yes. Countries that range from Pakistan, India, Turkey, Russia, those are the cases in the book, but also, of course, the United States. And so what are the lessons that we can draw from the case studies in the book that we can apply globally? Um, the second takeaway point in the book is that we need motivations matter. So when we look at all these different actors involved in these conflicts, like the state, but also the non-state actors themselves, we really need to understand them, what drives them, what motivates these actors. We shouldn't assume it's just money or, or religion or just one thing. Motivations matter, we need to understand them, but motivations also change, people are complex. So we need to really look closely at what drives people to make really difficult decisions at times, which is, to wield and to use violence against other human beings. So that's the second takeaway point. Um, and I'll stop here for now. Let, I'll, get, I'll let the panelists uh, share their impressions, and I'd be happy to address any questions. Thank you. Speak from here or from the podium. So, Aparna? Oh, it's gone. Good. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Um, good afternoon. I'd like to start by thanking uh, Trevor and Nidhi uh, for inviting me, and it's a pleasure to be on the same panel with Shoja Saab, Yelena, and Michael. I'd like to congratulate uh, Yelena on an excellent book. It's a must read for anybody who wants to understand the relationship between state and non state actors. Um, Yelena has already sort of put forth the main argument of her book. Um, I'll focus my remarks on something which she did not speak on, and I presume she was expecting one of the other panelists would touch on that, and that is the broader question of Kashmir um, and the India-Pakistan relationship. Um, sort of, I mean, the, Yelena's book argues that states with strong security forces are not always able to do what they want, and they often need non-state allies for tactical benefits. Um, and these uh, groups have their own interests. It could be material payoffs. It could be ideological alignments. Um, in the case of Kashmir, what she looks at is the insurgency inside Jammu and Kashmir um, and argues that both the security forces and the local proxies benefited temporarily. Um, the Indian state, from the short term, regained control over the valley, though then the insurgency moved to the area of Jammu. And the Kashmir Valley-based proxies benefited because they thought they could regain control uh, from the foreign uh, Pakistani-based jihadis. But in the long run, they actually lost out to Hezbollah and foreign jihadis. Um, what the, what um, Yelena's book does not look at, and, and that's not what the book is focused on, is how do pa India and Pakistan look at Kashmir? And why, why are we having this discussion today? Um, the two countries have very different views on Kashmir. India's position is that Jammu and Kashmir lawfully acceded to India in 1947 when the Maharaja signed the instrument of accession. And that successive elections in Jammu and Kashmir from the 1950s mean um, that they, they have ascertained the will of the people and Kashmir is an integral part of India. Pakistan's position is that Kashmir is the unfinished business of partition and that a plebiscite should be held in Jammu and Kashmir in accordance with the UN resolutions. Um, India sees Kashmir as an, not as an international dispute, but a bilateral one. And for India, the Shimla Agreement of 1972, 
reiterated by the 1999 uh, Lahore Agreement is how the two countries should discuss any India-Pakistan issue, not just Kashmir. Um, before I stop, I'd like to make three quick points and I'm happy to elaborate later. There are three parts of the Kashmir issue, I believe, uh, which sometimes are seen only as one. One is the question of terrorism. Um, there are jihadi groups that operate inside Kashmir, and many of them do have roots inside Pakistan. Second, there's the question of grievances of Kashmiris. But here I would say it is not just Jammu and Kashmir. We should also talk about the grievances of uh, Gilgil Baltistan and the northern areas. They do technically form part of what was Kashmir, if we are talking about Kashmiri grievances. And third is the broader issue of India and Pakistan within which Kashmir forms uh, one aspect. Um, I believe Kashmir is a symptom. It is not the cause of India-Pakistan tensions. I will stop there, and I'm happy to talk about any of these issues uh, in the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Aparna. Michael. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Shuja. Thank you for having me. Thank you to the Atlantic Council. Uh, it's great to be here, as always. Uh, I also offer my congrats to Yelena for the, for the wonderful book. It's a terrific product. I certainly recommend it to you all. Um, I uh, will use my brief comments to talk about ways forward. I was going to say a little bit about the intractability of the conflict. I think that uh, Aparna has done a good job of laying out why the two sides see so differently. Happy to go into that more. Um, but uh, I could just speak about the issue of what, if anything, can and should be done. And I think the logical question to ask sitting here in Washington is, is there a role um, for uh, Washington? Is there something that the U.S. should do? And I'll be very simple here. Frankly, um, Given the importance of the U.S. relationship with India these days, I just which and we know that India ex opposes external involvement in the Kashmir dispute. I doubt that Washington would want to put itself in a position where it offers itself up as a mediator um, in the dispute. Um, if we look at recent history, it's quite clear that you don't actually need external mediation to move things forward. Uh, more than a decade ago, I think we all remember that President Pakistani President Pervez Musharraf came up with a, uh, with a, a four-point peace plan. Um, it was a short-lived affair. Uh, it certainly had buy-in from the Indian side uh, for quite some time, but it didn't go anywhere. Um, if we want to talk about external mediation, if we, if we want to talk about any type of outside entity that should be involved in this, um, in this dispute, it should be the UN, which has issued a series of resolutions over the years, quite a few resolutions over the years, on Kashmir, many of which call for an eventual plebiscite, though only after a series of conditions related to demilitarization have been met, which sometimes is forgotten on the Pakistan side. Um, at any rate, India and Pakistan have shown that they are quite capable of, of putting, a, uh, putting together a plan to move forward. But I think at the same time, I would readily admit that there's never been a less likely moment to expect any type of breakthrough between India and Pakistan on Kashmir. The relationship, the India-Pakistan relationship, as we know, is is a mess uh, right now. And the government the, in India does not appear to have much of an inclination at all, um, at least now, to relaunch a formal dialogue with Pakistan, and certainly not one related to Kashmir. Um, I think that Pakistan may recognize how difficult it would be to get traction on a cross-border, much less international dialogue on Kashmir. And in this regard, you know, I've been struck how the government in Pakistan in recent weeks, even recent months, has seemingly gone quiet on Kashmir in its international messaging. Uh, you used to hear the government, the Pakistani government, bring it up a lot, particularly in the UN, uh, in order to focus the, uh, the international community's attention on the rights violations in, in Kashmir, which of course are very real, to say the least. But don't really hear that messaging as much. There's certainly a lot of advocacy on behalf of, uh, in favor of bringing attention to the Kashmir issue. Uh, led by Pakistanis and by Kashmiris uh, on social media. Um, there's a lot of it there, and it's quite aggressive and quite indecorous, to say the least. Um, but of late, offline, I just don't hear it that much coming from, from the Pakistani government in its speeches and statements targeting an international audience. Um, I think what, what's needed above all is some type of incentive structure that favors some type of internal dialogue between key uh, political stakeholders in Kashmir and in New Delhi, but I don't think the time for that is now. I, I think the political environment, political environment 
is simply too fraught right now, uh, and the political will in New Delhi is, is really not there. Um, and you know, to wrap up, the, the low likelihood of any type of significant forward movement anytime soon, either internally or between India and Pakistan, you know, I think is, is troubling. And that's because if you look at um, uh, Jammu and Kashmir, uh, the dispute is clearly a powder keg. That's what I would argue, at least. Um, you know, anger among Kashmiris is growing. It seems like every human rights group on the planet is coming out with a report bringing attention to uh, alleged abuses, including torture, and the UN has called for a formal investigation. Uh, just today, they came out, the UN came out with a new report calling for um, the, both sides, India and Pakistan, to deal with the concerns that were raised by the UN in a report that it issued last year. Um, so I think we could soon en enter into a new intense period. One possible trigger could be a move that the Indian government might make to um, revoke two key cl constitutional clauses, Article 370 and 35A. These are what give Kashmir its, its Jammu and Kashmir its special status as an autonomous region and gives Kashmiris its special rights and privileges. Um, you know, the, the, the ruling BJP has long uh, kept this possibility open of trying to go through that process of revoking Article 370, um, with the argument being that it's time to fully and constitutionally integrate um, Kashmir into the Union of India. Um, and the way to do that is to revoke the, the clause that gives it its autonomous uh, status. Um, it had been somewhat of a remote possibility for some time, but it does seem that in recent weeks there's been a bit more noise coming from the in Indian government about this possibility. So Ahmed Shah, who is, as we all know, is a top official within the BJP, he was, he was uh, appointed the home minister in the new government in India. Uh, he made a speech, I believe it was his first speech after he took up his new position in the new government, in which he said that uh, Article 370 is, is temporary and was never meant to be um, permanent. So I think the repercussions of such a move, um, if it were to happen, and certainly it's still hypothetical at this, at this moment, should not be understated. And I think it could have major implications, to say the least. Um, in the region. So, thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, let me just say a few things um, in light of uh, the, the opening comments by our panelists, and then, then we'll get into uh, a little more depth on some of the issues that you've raised. Um, first, I think on both sides of the India-Pakistan border, there's now, perhaps for the first time in a long time, a realization that uh, the Kashmiris now play a very important role in any discussion. Uh, this was not the case till, till the 80s, and then gradually the Kashmiri voice started being heard. Uh, and it's not just a Kashmiri voice that is being uh, controlled and directed and supplied from the Pakistan side, but internally too. Uh, it just so happens this is the third anniversary of the, the death of Burhan Wani, uh, which is uh, uh, likely to be uh, a hot issue uh, within Kashmir uh, because this is when demonstrations take place and then the security forces uh, either show up and their presence then exacerbates the situation and then uh, you have trouble. Uh, the other thing that has changed, and here um, I might disagree a little with Michael, but only because I'm putting on my optimist hat, which is looking for solutions, and that is that for the first time in a long time, uh, you have a very powerful uh, government in India at the center, which is not beholden uh, to coalition partners. Uh, you also have a relatively strong government at the center in Pakistan, which uh, at least appears to be uh, much more on the same page uh, as the military in Pakistan, which. Uh, has a strong voice in what happens in Kashmir or Afghanistan or, or the nuclear issue or the United States relationship. Um, previous governments also talked about being on the same page, but um, quite often, even if they were on the same page, as I mentioned in an earlier report on militancy in Pakistan, they were on the same page in different books. And so uh, they really weren't uh, acting in concert. Uh, now it seems that they are. The other are some very pregnant uh, statements that have been coming out of the uh, army chief in Pakistan, including the one that uh, only the state must retain the monopoly of power, which means that armed militant groups within the country will not be tolerated. 
Now, we've heard similar statements in the past. The question is, what will be done to disarm uh, those groups and disband them? And does that include uh, groups that uh, operate in Kashmir with or without the state's support? Uh, and is the recent action against the, the uh, group headed by Hafiz Said more a reaction to the imposition of restrictions on Pakistan by the, the Financial Action Task Force uh, and the IMF? Or is this really an attempt at uh, reaching out to India and saying, look, uh, we're going to hold our guys in check. Uh, let's bring the Kashmiris into the discussion and you try and resolve them. Uh, and I think domestically within India, as Michael pointed out, the pressure will be there uh, to try and defuse the Kashmir situation uh, because uh, it is a lot of expenditure and it is, you know, the, by all counts, um, 400 to 600,000 military and paramilitary forces in a small area uh, fighting against militants whose numbers continue to confound us. Um, when I ask experts in India about the numbers, they said there were three or 400 armed militants in Kashmir. Th that's almost unbelievable, but if that's the case, it's a very expensive uh, ratio of forces to, to militants. And uh, obviously that, that is not an economic uh, return on investment of those resources at a time when both India and Pakistan need resources very badly. So I just wanted to, to put that out. So with, that, with that in mind, um, I wanted to ask uh, Elena if, if looking at experiences elsewhere, governments act in their own interest. Um, do they really learn uh, from their experiences? And India and Pakistan have been at it now for over 70 years. Uh, what, if anything, have they learned from their experience in um, fomenting either cross-border terrorism or uh, creating armed militants that fight each other? It's a great question of learning. Um, in general, when we look at sort of military strategy, we do see very little learning that happens over time. But um, I think there has been changes in Pakistan. When we look at Pakistani behavior, when we compare cases from let's say 71, which is what I do, uh, the war in East Pakistan, which created Bangladesh, to what happened in the tribal areas in 2008, in the, in the 2000s, where um, Pakistan seemed to have learned from the experience of um, how difficult it is to manage proxies and actually was quite hesitant to work with Lashkars at, in the tribal areas um, for quite a few years. Um, there were Lashkars forming against the encroachment of the Taliban, and um, Pakistan did not want to get involved with those until US pressure kind of led Pakistan to really needing to confront the Taliban insurgency and work together with the Lashkars. Even then, though, the, um, the arms were very limited. So, so limited that the Lashkars were decimated, many of them, quite quickly. So, there's, so that could be an instance of learning from past um, behavior. Um, Perhaps I'm trying to think of other instances of learning um, <laughs> where sort of learning how to manage them. So not necessarily learning sort of not to use them or to, to withhold from using them, but how do you manage them? How do you work with them? There's various strategies that Pakistan, India, Russia, Turkey have used. You know, they, they, they worked with multiple groups at once. They don't sort of, they try not to empower one group until that one group becomes too powerful for them to control. Uh, so they try to manage, but that sort of that doesn't work out um, ultimately. Um, yeah, so so I, I would say quite limited learning, which is why I wrote this book, <laughs> so we can learn from those cases and maybe apply that to the future instances. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Aparna, at the official level, um, are the ministries of foreign affairs in and external affairs, respectively? Uh, going to be taking the lead on the internal discussions on what to do about Kashmir? Uh, or is this uh, the remit of, of some other group, like the Home Ministry in India uh, and uh, Army Headquarters or the ISI in Pakistan? I think it, I think you know the answer better than I do, Shuja Saab, but I believe, because you know the country, you know Pakistan quite well, but I would say uh, interior and home will, will focus more on uh, 
more on Kashmir than MEA and MFA. And the reason is that I don't see, um, you know, as you know, sort of traditionally every time a new civilian prime minister comes in India or Pakistan, um, there's an outreach and the cycle of talk starts. And part of it is Kashmir. For India, it is terrorism in the last two decades. For Pakistan, it's always been Kashmir. Uh, Mr. Modi, when he came 2014, he did, he invited all the South Asian heads of state. Mr. Sharif came. He dropped by in Lahore on his way back from Kabul. But since 2016, this has stopped, this, uh, this outreach. This time, the focus was not South Asia. It was BIMSTEC in a way to avoid having to invite Pakistan uh, to the inauguration. The reason, I think, is that there is no, I mean, India's argument officially is we will have a dialogue with Pakistan as long as you act on terrorism. Terrorism first, then we talk on everything, including Kashmir. Uh, the Pakistani argument is we are taking action on terrorism, quote unquote, but let us start and let us focus on Kashmir first. Um, I don't see the Indian side changing that sort without there being some some sort of, you know, some real action which India believes is taking. So, action against lashkar e taiba or jesh e Muhammad or changing their names or doing it temporarily for FATF. Um, I don't think that the Indian side or even the American side is fully convinced that Pakistan is really this time round acting on those terror groups. So, I don't believe the, the overall, I mean, that there will be a talk between the foreign ministries. I believe it will be each side looking at its part of Kashmir and trying to make sure that it can manage it or handle it rather than having a cross-country dialogue um, on Kashmir. Now, interestingly, uh, and this has been one of my arguments, that it's really the economy on both sides that's going to be the driver. Because both governments have made promises which they're going to find very hard to keep. Uh, Mr. Modi needs to create 13 to 15 million jobs, a new jobs a year. Mr. Imran Khan needs to create 1 million jobs, new jobs a year. They're, no lo they're nowhere close to that. The, the growth figures uh, for India have been brought down by Mr. Subramaniam to closer to 4% uh, plus, uh, and Pakistan is already below 4. Uh, and so in Pakistan, a new center of gravity has emerged for some of these changes, which is the Ministry of Finance, because that is the one that is affected by the FATF. So um, Michael can think about this too, but can you talk about whether the need to focus on domestic needs is going to make Kashmir either be put on the back burner or put on in a neutral mode, uh, a little bit like the Musharraf formula of, of, you know, let it evolve on its own and, you know, we'll come back to it later, but let's talk about other things. I guess my answer would be yes and no. And the reason is that if you're an optimist, I'm an optimist realist. I'm certain that things will go wrong, even if though I, I wish that they would get better. So uh, from the 1990s, um, India pushed for trade with all its neighbors. India offered MFN in 1996, which just recently, I think last year, we withdrew from Pakistan. Um, Pakistan's uh, chambers of commerce have repeatedly brought, in, brought out reports saying that better ties with India will benefit Pakistan's economy. It has unfortunately not, mat not made that much of an impact on the military to change the military's policy towards India. So two decades of Pakistani chambers of commerce and businessmen arguing or sort of making the point that better ties with India helps has not changed. So I don't believe that the Ministry of Finance will be able to do it because the Ministry of Finance um, will at the end of the day sort of have to work within the confines that it is limited to. Um, and I don't believe that, I believe it's a political, it's a, it's a decision to be made by the military intelligence service of Pakistan that do we want a better relationship with all of our neighbors or is the fact that um, sort of, you know, having this sort of having um, a combative relationship with our largest neighbor benefits us. They have to decide. On the Indian side, um, till quite recently, India's argument was, yes, you know, um, trade, 
tourism, connectivity with all our neighbors. Um, when he was foreign secretary, Mr. Jay Shankar said, you cannot be a regional or a global player unless you have a neighbors rooting for you. Um, but the uh, but sort of so, which is why MFN better relations is was the way India was pushing it till a year or two ago. And I think here um, the collapse of the sort of the initiative of 2015, um, the mm, terror attacks, the changing public opinion in India has led the Indian government to back off on whether or not it should push economic ties with Pakistan. I don't see that changing. What are the indicators that you would be looking for to see this shift in the Pakistani position? Um, something more than, I mean, I would say, I'll just give you one example. Uh, instead of putting Mr. Hafiz Saeed simply in house arrest and then releasing him every few months <laughs> and putting him sort of, you know, his house arrest is not on terrorism charges but on something totally different. Maybe some action against terror, a uh, terror uh, sort of a person labeled a global terrorist on terrorism charges <laughs> would would demonstrate uh, to to India that that Pakistan is taking action. Nobody says you can act against all the thousand groups, but acting against some of them and then sticking to it and actually acting against them on terrorism grounds, not mainstreaming terrorists into society or not or just putting them on house arrest for uh, for, for some other reason. I think it's sort of, uh, I think that would make a difference, not just to India, it would make a difference to FATF, it would make a difference to many other countries, the US as well. But a necessary part of that would be cooperation between India and Pakistan in collecting that evidence. And here I would add, in actually accepting evidence the other gives you. Yes. <laughs> right? Trust, well, trust I mean, but verify. Is, I mean, yeah. I mean um, sort of, to some extent, even if the in, you don't accept the Indian evidence, accept the American evidence. Accept evidence yes. against groups, but sort of don't deny the evidence given, whether it's a neighbor or it's the US. That brings me to Michael, who's now had time to think about all of this and will give us <laughs> uh, a well-rounded response. What, if anything, can the U.S. do at a time when, for the first time in its history of the relationship, the U.S. with, the, with South Asia, it has good relations with India, very good relations with India, and sort of good relations with Pakistan. Let's put it that way. Yeah, so uh, I think the, uh, the important thing to consider here is actually uh, a country that we haven't brought up at all, and that's Afghanistan. That, uh, you know, right now the U.S. relationship with Pakistan is focused on the Afghanistan lens. And this, this is not new. I mean, typically when the U.S. looks at the relationship with Pakistan, it looks at, that, it looks at the relationship through the lens of Afghanistan. And the U.S. government believes that uh, the Pakistanis are being very helpful in the current, or not very helpful, but are being helpful in the current negotiations um, with the Taliban. And I think that the fact that the U.S. perceives the Pakistanis in that light now makes it unlikely that the U.S. will want to really sort of push ahead one way or the other. I think we want to try to sort of keep uh, a rather understated position uh, on the whole, so long as these negotiations are going through with Afghanistan. Because let's, let's be very clear, I mean, the top U.S. Uh, objective right now in South Asia is a deal with the Taliban. Uh, you know, the India-Pakistan relationship is certainly important. The, rela the U.S. relationship with India is very important. But um, you know, the issue of the India-Pakistan relationship, the issue of Kashmir, really does not register high uh, on the list of priorities. Certainly, you know, the U.S. has always felt that um, uh, U.S. interests are better served by having an India-Pakistan relationship that's relatively stable, and certainly a relationship that does not involve the two being at war. Um, so in that regard, <coughs> I think the, the United States government certainly would want to do what it can to step in if need be, if it sees that tensions between the two sides are getting worse, and try to help defuse them. And I think there is evidence that that did happen to an extent with the recent crisis earlier this year. But the issue of the U.S. trying to preemptively come in and try to get the two sides talking more, uh, I don't see that happening uh, on, a, on a large level other than something completely you know, behind the scenes, uh, that type of thing. But really, the focus will be on Afghanistan. That said, um, the U.S. has been and will continue to use 
multilateral global forums as a pressure point of sorts to target uh, Pakistan and the terrorism issue. I think we've seen that with, uh, you know, with the, the FATF, the, you know, the, the Financial Action Task Force um, group that recently concluded that it was not satisfied with the progress Pakistan has made on countering uh, uh, terrorist financing. And, uh, and it's a multilateral organization, but the U.S. clearly played a role there uh, in trying to get like-minded states to not give Pakistan an easy pass. And I think using those multilateral forums is, is easier. It's not as harsh for the United States in terms of the pressure that it, that it applies on, on, on Pakistan. Um, you know, the Trump administration, for all the talk about how it'll take a harder line on Pakistan, it really hasn't done that. There hasn't really been much. I mean, they suspended security assistance uh, last year, but that's basically it, and that's not new. That's happened before. Beyond that, there really have not been many harsh steps that have been taken at all. So I think that it really comes down to the fact that the U.S. certainly is um, very eager to, to further its relationship with India, uh, particularly with some major tensions in the U.S.-India relationship now on the commercial side. But um, when it comes to trying to cooperate with India more to push back further on Pakistan, I think that that is going to be deferred um, so long as you have this very delicate negotiation uh, in Afghanistan, which sort of to the surprise of many of us skeptics is actually moving along quite well at this point, the negotiations. Um, so um, I, I guess I'll, I'll wrap up there. But going back to the question you posed earlier about what, what governments have learned about um, providing uh, outsourcing violence, as, as, as Elena's term is, outsourcing violence to non-state groups. You know, one thing I oftentimes think about a lot is some of these cases in Pakistan um, of these assets of the state that end up turning on the state. I mean, it's happened quite frequently. Uh, you know, it's, uh, Elias Kashmiri is a famous case. He was a, Kashmir, he was a freedom fighter in Kashmir. He became an al-Qaeda commander. And then you had um, this guy, Mast Gol, who was, um, uh, I believe, was with the, with the the, uh, one of the, the Kashmiri groups, he ended up turning, on, uh, turning his, uh, his attention or his focus to the Pakistani Taliban, and he became a leader of that group. So, you know, it's sort of a cliche, but uh, in the context of Pakistan's policy, it really plays with fire when it harbors uh, links to these groups that it th and to these individuals that it feels can be helpful to help serve its, its goals and interests, but these, these folks sometimes turn on the Pakistani state. And of course, this is not unique to Pakistan. Thank you. Um, we're going to open it up now. So as I notice who's raised his or her hand, I'll come to you, uh, the gentleman over there. Please remember a uh, question and keep it short so that everyone can get an opportunity. And then um, please identify yourself. Hello, my name is Utsa. And uh, my question uh, to anybody who would like to answer in the panel is, uh, Recently, today, uh, Asif Kapoor, uh, the, the DGISPR from Pakistan, uh, made a statement eulogizing and uh, giving a lot of praise for Buran One, uh, the terrorist who was killed two, three years ago, today. Uh, Buran One was on record supporting uh, Islamic State, ISIS. And he actually went on record saying that he would wish that someday the Islamic Caliphate could be established in Kashmir as well. So. Given the fact that we are saying that Pakistan is making moves and giving statements and indications about tracking back from supporting uh, terror groups, how do you read today's statement from Mr. Gafur? Elena? Um, well, again, this sort of is, is consistent with sort of Pakistan's policy and policy of many countries to play both sides, to play all sides, right? Um, and. Um, there's, uh, after the, um, the Peshawar attack in school as well, there was uh, statements um, by, I think it was the leader of Lashkar Taiba, who kind of said, oh, if India is to blame, we're, gonna, we're going to attack India now. And he was featured in, on television and sort of given airtime. So, so this, is, this, is just, this, this is just what happens. And that's it, what happens, again, when you're playing all sides. You don't want to pick a side. Um, so it's going to continue because this is part of the game, and it's it's extremely um, dangerous game. Um, but it's hard to get out of it. How 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 do you stop this game once you start it? Do you eliminate these people? Do you just you know do you assassinate them? How do you, what do you do you jail them? And this this might trigger others. Other commandos will rise. So it's it's a, such a complicated issue. Uh, so if you have any advice, <laughs> that's always appreciated. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. 
uh, Linia said, I agree with her. But it's also a question of you can sort of, you know, if you have assets, you have to at some stage, as Jelena mentioned earlier, you have to decide do you want to eliminate all of them, you know, re educate them, or sort of, you know, what do you do with them? Um, if you don't want to do that and you at some level believe that that asset, maybe not now, maybe five years from now, ten years from now, when things don't go the way you want them to go, will be of use to you. Then you are. Then you have to give lead by example. If you um, don't support the asset today, then ten years down, other assets will no longer come and help you because they believe that you have given up on us. So very often, um, sort of that. That's part of the reason why you know. In many of the examples you've given, in whether it's uh, East Pakistan, it's the Naxalites, it's Kashmir. The reason that that state structures often support them is you don't want other assets to believe that you are not going to support them. So, till the day that the established Pakistan Islamic decides that they are going to stick to some assets, they have to support all their assets because otherwise the other assets will say that you know you didn't support X Y Z. Why should we believe that we'll support you? Will still support us? The day that changes, this will also change. Uh, but till that time, support. You have to demonstrate that you are with your assets. Did you want to add anything? Yeah, like? very quickly. I think the way in which Burhan Wani is portrayed by the Indian uh, and the Pakistani governments is really indicative of the sharply divergent perceptions of the, of the conflict on a whole, right? I mean, if you believe, as, as, as most Kashmiris and Pakistanis believe, that uh, you know, India is occupying uh, Jammu and Kashmir, then naturally, you know, anyone who opposes the Indian forces there, anyone who may support uh, attacks on the Indian forces there, they resist their, their heroes, they resist their freedom fighters. Whereas if you believe that this is Indian territory, it's part of the Indian Union, then anyone like Burhan Wani who opposes the state and would favor attacks on the Indian security forces is a terrorist, pure and simple. So I think that's where the sharply divergent perceptions are. Next question over here. Hi, thank you. I'm Jake Ansar with the Hindu American Foundation. Uh, please forgive me if this question offends any of those on the panel, but I do feel it's necessary to ask, particularly in the, co in the context of the Kashmiri Pandit community, who are Hindu. 350,000 of them were driven out of their homes and in the insurgency that began three decades ago. Why has the think tank community and, I, and I, we can talk about the failures of the Indian side to take care of them, the Pakistani side who perpetrated the insurgency to drive them out of their home. But why has the think tank community literally failed to bring their conditions and to bring their plight to the international uh, arena in an objective manner? You don't have to, you, you don't have to uh, subjectively do it, but I would say that it's a failure and I wanna know why that failure continues to occur. Michael, I think he was looking at you. Yeah, he was looking at me. Yeah, I noticed that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there, there are three think tanks. I'm going to say he's looking at you. No. <laughs> um, first of all, I had conversa I've had conversations with this with, with many folks, including you, I'm sure, uh, at, at some point or the other. Yes. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'll just say that speaking for my own think tank, I don't want to speak for other think tanks represented in the panel. I mean, the Wilson Center is a nonpartisan organization. It's a think tank. It's not an adv advocacy organization. So, you know, we're not in a position to try to make this into some type of, of campaign. But certainly, you know, I'm quite sure that in all the, the activities that we've done over the years, um, this issue has, has come up. I'm quite, I'm quite sure of that. And I'm happy to try to provide you with some type of citation at some point, but I'll leave it, I'll leave it with that. Aparna, what about the Hudson <laughs> Institute? <laughs> well, um, I'm going to basically say what Michael said, which is that um, we are also a, a non-advocacy group. We have had a number of events on India and Pakistan as well as Kashmir, and you have attended, I think, almost all of them. Um, so yes, so Jay knows where we stand on the issues, um, but sort of you know happy to have any other um, happy to have a discussion in which in which we can talk more about this. But I asked this question in the context of the other human rights violations that genuinely do get a lot of attention by the groups that are represented here, but it seems like this issue has literally gotten no no attention by the think tank. 
let, let me turn it around. Mm -hmm. I think it, it's a question of uh, getting the attention of folks in Washington. Uh, this has not been a, a very prominent issue in the Washington mm -hmm. echo chamber. And maybe that's where interaction of groups like yours and others uh, can, can raise the volume on it. Uh, think tanks um, essentially operate within that atmosphere and you don't have the resources, and this is not an excuse, this is just an explanation. You don't have a, the resources to have a wide range of topics covered, so you kind of pick and choose. So that's just one explanation. Uh, at the back, uh, the lady in, Thank you. Hi, my name is Mahin. Um, thank you for all your interesting comments. Um, uh, pardon my ignorance. I'm just wondering why is there never a single Kashmiri academic on the panel when talking about Kashmir? That's a good question. Um, and, and maybe um, we're waiting for people like you to emerge. Because <coughs> yes, yes. We, I think it'd be a very good idea to engage with the leadership of the various <laughs> think tanks so that uh, uh, that gap can be filled. Uh, but that's a very good question. Thank you. Um, lady at the back could have saved you the trip. I'm trying to go in the order that I saw people, so. Um, hi, my name is Navnita. Um, quick questions uh, for Yelena. I'm just intrigued by the conceptual argument that you make in your book, if you can just spend a minute or two. You argue that Every state uses these groups, but then, you know, uh, Shuja Nawaz has referred the question, what implications does it have for the state's monopoly over instruments of violence? Is the state willingly partaking its uh, monopoly? And then how does it reflect on the state structure itself? Where does that leave Pakistani state, for example? Because a lot of these groups, as Michael also talked about, have come back mm -hmm. and actually targeted the Pakistani mm -hmm. state. So, uh, you know, even during Musharraf's time, there was an argument of Pakistan first. Visa visa these non-state armed jihadi groups and their relationship with the Pakistani state. Conceptually, empirically, how do you see that playing out? And second question is with regard to the Kashmiri militants, and that's both addressed to Michael and uh, you. It was never so simple a uh, relationship, you know, going back uh, that if you're opposed to Indian state, then you're a freedom fighter or you're a terrorist. There is a whole range of positions in the 90s and today. In fact, the internecine militant warfare that has already started playing out, even within the valley, it actually does make a difference precisely where those non-state actors are coming from. What position do they take? In that regard, how do you see these non-state actors, the proxy actors? Uh, if they are coming still across the border, what relationship do they have with the Kashmiri militants? What relationship do they have with the populist, common people? because they're beginning to oppose. Thank they you. Have always opposed. Thank you. I think we've got your question. Could I suggest we take one more question on the uh, outside over there so you can answer two questions at a time? We're running out of time. I want to get the maximum number of questions in. I have two quick questions. Ah. Okay, I please, to please identify yourself for the okay. group. Thank you. Um, my name is Karen, and I represent uh, Kashmiri Muslim diaspora here in Washington, try to. Um, my one question for Shujat is, uh, where did this myth originate that a strong arm government would be more benevolent or more willing to strike up a compromise? You know, I've been having this argument ever since the campaign in India was mm -hmm. over because there were a great deal of Kashmiris saying this. And where is a precedent of this? Indira Gandhi didn't do it, and she certainly was, you know, very powerful. So, you know, if you can say this. And my second question is to the author, and I can't wait to read your book. Um, do you, did you write at all about the sta uh, state-sponsored Ikhwan in Kashmir, mm -hmm. which to me is the most cruel and most brutal state-sponsored militant group, mm -hmm. group mm -hmm. that was ever created. And yeah. living there, I came across remnants of them. Mm -hmm. And I tell you, scary, mm -hmm. really scary. Thank you, thank you, Karen. You, you yes. want to? 
Yes, um, so I'll, I'll start with the question. So the, the paradox that you pointed to, I'm a political scientist, we expect the state to want to monopolize violence, right? And, and to give it away, especially when you have such a strong military, when you're Pakistan, India, Turkey, Russia, you have such a strong military, why would you share your resources? Why would you use others? Why not just use your professionals, use your special forces, whatever you can do. So that, that is the paradox that I encountered, and that's why I wrote this book as a political scientist. And what I find is that it's just weird. The, the way we think about the state governments is just wrong. These, con you know, they, they do tend to outsource, uh, even countries with strong militaries at times, uh, as my theory predicts, uh, would you know, use non-state actors when it benefits them, especially when they encounter really difficult conflicts like Kashmir. Um, and then it's more at the tactical level. There are these problems they cannot solve, and they just don't want to lose. So states, especially with strong militaries, don't want to lose. So what do they do? So they step outside of the legal bounds, the international law, and then they break the rules. So learning to lose is something that you know, states don't want to do. Um, and the Kashmiris, and so what we see is that a lot of the militants are native Kashmiris. Um, like the, the recent terrorist attack, that was a, that was a native Kashmiri. Um, so we shouldn't um, kind of just think of these are Pakistani outsiders or just kind of coming into Kashmir and carrying out these attacks. A lot of these individuals are so frustrated, particularly like what Karen said, all this history, this experience with groups like Ikhwan al-Muslimun, right? Coco Pere, all these individuals, they remember being harassed by them and they know that the state, that the military worked with them. So there's this history that um, as outsiders don't really think about in terms of human rights violations, but these people know, and, and it's part of what sort of drives to their radicalization um, as well. And of course, of course, these, the group that you've mentioned is prominent in my really in-depth description and kind of bringing in Coco Pere's story and others like him and, and the things that they've done to the local population is a very important part of this book. Thank Having you. read the book, Karen, I can assure you that she's <laughs> given it at full coverage. Um, to answer mm -hmm. your question uh, about the myth very briefly, and you and I can have a more detailed discussion offline. Um, when you're not strong, you are constantly sniped at from the sidelines. And there are very few governments in e either India or Pakistan that want to take on that additional burden of having to fight off opponents on the domestic front uh, when you take an initiative on the, uh, across the border, particularly between India and Pakistan. Uh, so it, it takes, you know, it took a Musharraf who, who was all in all uh, because he was the army chief and the president to make an overture towards India. Mm. Uh, but uh, if you go back to the 80s and 90s, uh, whenever Benazir Bhutto made a, an overture, Nawaz Sharif would end up in Sialkot near the Kashmir border and give a speech saying she was giving up on, on Kashmir and the Kashmiri people and, and he would invoke his own uh, antecedents from Kashmir and, you know, fight to the last drop of blood, et cetera. So those are the issues, really, why, when you have a strong central government, that it, it can afford to make these kinds of overtures. That, that was really all I was trying to say. Well, we'll go to the gentleman here, and then the gentleman here. And I'm sorry, but this, these will be the last two questions. I'll Could try to be brief. Re Jeff McCausland from uh, Dickinson College. Michael, my question to you is, I agree wholeheartedly that right now Washington's a focal point is trying to find a graceful way out of Afghanistan. But let's assume that's successful in the next few months. Then what impact will that have on stability in, the, in South Asia? And the second question, you know, uh, someone very wisely once said the difference between an optimist and a pessimist is a pessimist is better informed. As I listen to the panel right now, I would like to know why wouldn't I have the following hypothesis, that we have a very strong nationalistic government in India, it benefited from a strong response to the crisis back in February. We have a very weak financially strapped government in Pakistan <coughs> that can perhaps cannot provide assistance to these groups in the way it did in the past. We have a growing number of these groups who are more and more independent that may be having a backlash. We have the rise of ISIS. So we're painting a picture of an inevitable circle of continuing crises and inevitable major conflict in South Asia. Please tell me I'm wrong. <coughs> Thank you. <laughs> If you could pass the mic here, please. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Raghubir Goyal. I'm a journalist in Washington. First of all, this issue has been going on for over 70 years. So many prime ministers in Pakistan have come and gone. And so same thing uh, in India, so many governments. 
But many people believe that politicians in India and ISI and military in Pakistan, they have <coughs> opened their shops in the name of Kashmir. Until, unless those shops are closed, this issue may not be resolved peacefully. Second, uh, Prime Minister uh, Imran Khan will be in Washington very soon meeting President Trump at the White House. How things will be changed under his leadership since no, nothing can happen in Pakistan without the military or ISI. No, no prime minister in Pakistan co can operate without their consent or their willingness. And now Prime Minister Modi has fully endorsed by the people in India. So how the two can work together to end this really uh, conflict or people in both sides wants peaceful resolution of this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, briefly, maybe inject a, a little bit of optimism is that uh, one, one actor we haven't talked about at all is China. And um, China is interested in stability in South Asia, so potentially it has a lot of influence over Pakistan. Lots of investment money is pouring in. So potentially it could help to stabilize. As US withdraws, China stepping more and more in. Um, so that's something to look for. So what is China's policy on that front? Um, um, just three quick points. One, um, I will mildly disagree with Delina. I don't believe China will play a, a positive role. I believe China, um, China's interests are very limited. And China has to date never sort of not really gone in in trying to stabilize other countries. Um, instead, it looks at its own economic strategic interests. So for China, um, sort of where it sees instability in Pakistan, it may just put in some more Chinese troops or pay for some more Pakistani troops to safeguard its infrastructure. Doesn't necessarily mean that China is interested in India-Pakistan bonhomie. Actually, China benefits from India-Pakistan not getting along because then Indian troops are also on the Chinese border and on the Indian border and they are divided. So I will disagree mildly. I also don't see China see, I mean, sort of benefiting from a stable Afghanistan, but it's, we have very little time left. Second point, uh, yes, India-Pakistan would benefit if we got along, um, have, it's a 5,000-year-old continent and only 70-year-old country. So I do believe we have a lot more in common. However, I do not see that happening in the next few years, unfortunately. Um, and sort of uh, third point is, so two points, sorry. Thank I'll you. Stop. Michael. Michael. Yeah, very briefly. I actually think looking at China, it's, it's a very complicated state of affairs, certainly. But China, I would think, would want more stability in Afghanistan to better allow it to build out its Belt and Road Initiative project, which at least at this point is still very much on the table for China. Uh, in terms of your, your other question, uh, or your question, sir, about um, the very big if, if there's some type of deal in Afghanistan, what that could mean, as I understand it, for stability in the region. Well, I don't know. First of all, it's a very big if. Uh, secondly, it depends on the type of deal you get. If you get some sort of deal that just entails U.S. forces leaving without a broader agreement, then Afghanistan's instability will get worse, which I think will certainly make India-Pakistan relations worse, particularly if Pakistani influence intensifies in Afghanistan. Best case scenario, if you get a deal in which there is a cessation of, uh, in which there's a ceasefire, the Taliban agrees to stop fighting, uh, there would probably be some type of Taliban role in a in a future dispensation, uh, I don't necessarily <laughs> think that would make India-Pakistan relations better. The two countries would continue to look at Afghanistan as a battlefield um, for, for competition of, of sorts. Until there's a peace between India and Pakistan, which is not going to happen anytime soon, I think Af that the Afghanistan story will continue to be very turbulent in that regard. And on the optimistic, pessimistic mm -hmm. business, um, my late friend, Arno de Burgrave, who brought me into the think tank world by hiring me to do a report on Fatah uh, way back in 2008 and 9, uh, used to accuse me of being an op eternal optimist. And his response to me was always that uh, a pessimist is an optimist with experience. <laughs> and I think uh, he may have been right on that. So I gradually uh, sort of veered a little away from the the extreme optimism to being uh, cautiously optimistic or even pessimistic at times. Uh, but the fact that the Prime Minister Imran Khan is coming on the 22nd um, uh, and will meet President Trump, um, 
we have two very similar personalities, people who go with their gut instincts, who believe strongly in what they believe in, right or wrong. Um, and if there is a solution in Afghanistan before that, uh, if, uh, not a solution, but a semblance of an agreement, and Zal Khalilzad uh, gets the Nobel Prize, uh, then uh, I think we're going to have uh, something emerge from those meetings. And it may well be something which is more regional. Uh, if that is the message that Imran Khan is bringing of regional connectivity and so on. Um, let me end on that slightly more positive and optimistic note. Uh, maybe that would help Kashmir also. And I do apologize to everyone else, including my friend Robin Rafel, who could probably have given us a full lecture on this whole issue because she knows it uh, so well. But uh, I wanted to thank all of you for your questions uh, and your suggestions. And I think uh, that have emerged from those questions. And thank Elena and Parna and uh, Michael. And uh, hope to see you all again soon. Thank you. <laughs>